I have uh, two announcements. First, uh, the, this t-shirt for this summer school. <laughs> but it's $8 uh, for a t-shirt and I think Alvaro and he's brought a box of boxes, boxes over there and you can buy them after this. And uh, another thing is uh, Ash Daniels here, say hi to everyone. And he's going to he's gonna, uh, do the uh, stage and make my tutorial in the after early afternoon. So, my lecture will be about local global compatibility and coherent algebras. So, for today, we're just going to talk about what coherent algebras are, and I'll spend some time talking about uh, the PI numbers QP. Uh, so, first, I'll do. Uh, I guess. When we start doing serious mathematics, we start to kind of define, every, redefine everything. Like the first thing we do is we define what it is to say natural numbers, and then the next thing is that we add zero and inverse of them negative numbers, and we get z, and then we take the field of fractions, that's q, and then the next step from q to r, there's a system of completion. Step. What we do is that we can so have this step. You can define R systematically from Q by doing some sort of uh, denting cut or completion, or whatever. There are several axioms uh, equivalent to each other. And from R, you can also go one step further to get to the field of complexes. That is adjoining the square root of negative 1. And we can wonder, can we do go one step further? The answer is, well, what do you mean? There's something called fundamental uh, theorem of algebra, which says that all complex coefficients, non-constant polynomial, fx has a zero. I mean, a complex zero. Uh, what the theorem says, well, one of the actually kind of equivalent way of stating a theorem is that this field of complex numbers is algebraic close. i.e. you cannot sort of enlarge C in a finite way to make a bigger field. So make like no bigger field. Containing uh, this compact number and at the same time it's finite dimensional. Uh, over C, but since C is two dimensional over R, so the same as saying finite dimension over R. So if we restrict ourselves to you know look for fields, there's no more beyond C. You can see itself the already argument close you can't enjoy anything that's not in C. Uh, well, still we I want to try to go beyond C and see what else is there. Uh, this is kind of all inspired by physics. Uh, it was in 1843. I think before that, uh, I just Wikipedia. I uh, <laughs> wrote uh, he, uh, This guy uh, actually independently discovered it before, three years before Hamilton. Anyways, but now we will always refer to that Hamilton. It says that you can, if you don't look for fields, but you kind of release the condition a little bit, you can find a sort of associative, but not commutative, 
Okay. And I said that we don't require the multiplication to a b equals b a. But if you want it to be associated with a b times c equals a times b c, then you can get something slightly bigger than c. I'm going to denote that by h, both face h. This is this four dimensional bar. It contains a real number, and Soro contains a compact number of the i. But in fact, you can see that j and k play the same role as i in some sense. Namely, anyway, if you square i, we know it's going to be negative 1. But this sort of whole thing to for i, j, and k. And as I said, that uh, this is not going to be commutative. The commutation relation is that if you do i, j, it's going to be k. So i times j equals k. And that's at the same time, if you multiply j and i the other way, you put a negative sign. So ij equals negative of ji. Similarly, you do jk, you get i, it's negative kj. And um, out of space, you get ki equals j equals negative i. It's kind of a very clever choice of how to define the relations. So I learned this from Keith that you can memorize this easily by drawing a diagram like this. I here, J here, and K here. You think that when you multiply I and J, if you do it uh, sorry, clockwise, you get the next one, K. If you do K, J and K, you do it clockwise, you get the next one. However, if you do it the other way, do so j times i, this, you, get, you do get k, but it's negative k. So, it's a good way of memorizing these relations. But we can also summarize these relations algebraically by viewing h as an algebra over r with two generators i and j. The reason I don't write brackets is because this is not going to be commutative, so it's a non commutative ring. But I caution out the ideal, or imposing relations about i and j by requiring i squared to be 1, excuse me, i squared to negative, negative 1, j squared to be negative 1. So, of course, i squared plus 1 is 0. And also, ij plus ji. Then, like, ij is negative ji. So, therefore, you just define k to be ij, and therefore, ji is negative. It's automatically negative ji. So this is called the uh, this is called the uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, I want to actually give another name. So it's not very mathematical. <laughs> Here I wrote associative but not committed field, a correct. Uh, Standard mathematical notation of this is a skill, skill field, it's to say. or if you would like to write a division ring. It has a property that I will get to in a minute that any non zero element in this ring has an inverse, but it's just not committed. So it looks like very much like a field, but not quite. <coughs> Talk about the inverse. How do I inverse such thing? In fact, like complex numbers, these quaternion elements, uh, they have sort of uh, not complex conjugation, but some sort of conjugation. Uh, so if I take an element, alpha, say, equals to, maybe I just want to be x plus yi. Uh, w k. Thinking of it as an element in quaternion, I can define its conjugate. To be uh, 
uh, alpha bar. Uh, when you define complex conjugation, you you change the sign in front of i. Now you sort of do the same thing. I think about j and k in the same way. You just sort of change the sign in front of all these j and k. And you can so let's let's do some calculation. The first one is called the choice of argon. Defined to be argon plus its conjugate. So all the IJKs cancel out, you get 2x. So this belongs to the reals. And maybe more interesting calculations to take the so-called norm of argon. It's like for complex numbers, this equals to alpha multiplied with alpha bar. Okay, now you have 16 terms. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> Alright, let's really do this. Uh, continue on. with x first. So I have x squared, right, x times x, and now I have x uh, times negative yi, and at the same time you have this x times positive yi, so they cancel out. So x times dj cancel with this x, this, this x times this negative dj cancel with this x times this plus dj. So these sort of cross terms cancel out, right? And now let's do maybe do y. Let's do yi. So, it so yi times negative yi. Right, so that's the next one you see. But we know that y, uh, i squared is negative 1. So this is just nothing but y squared. Okay? Uh, still hopeful there are quite a few other terms. So now I do yi times negative zj. And also zj times negative yi. So you have to be very careful working with quaternions because it's not commutative. You have to remember the order. It's y here. Y comes first, and then zj, the negative zj comes later. And same here, zj comes first, and then it's negative y. And if you combine these two together, uh, what do you see? Well, the real numbers uh, sort of moves out. It commutes with all the ijks. But then what do you see? Really, I'll take the negative sign out too. So here you have negative, negative sign, here you have negative, negative sign. So inside, I have ij plus ji. Remember that the order matters. Now we said earlier that ij is negative ji. So they cancel out. So this is 0. So somehow I check that the cross product, the, sort of the, the term involving y, uh, yz, the two sort of terms, they cancel each other exactly. And you can do sort of the same thing for the term involving zw and x w, uh, y w. They all sort of cancel out because the course, so one of them will give you i k, the other one will give you k i, and one of them will give you j k, the other one will give you k j. They all cancel out. So at the end, you only have these sort of squares. You have to sort of add. And then I kind of already see the answers. It's just x squared plus y. That's a norm. <coughs> this is also a real number. And now we kind of see how to invert this guy. See, what is our inverse then? Now let me stick it in here. So what is our inverse then? <coughs> if you look at the sum of squares, it's only zero if all the x, y, z, w's are zero. So therefore, this is almost always not zero. So you can, so therefore, alpha times alpha bar, is, I just want to say that somehow. Uh, 
Yeah, sorry. So this is by the button. And that's just our bar over x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Ah. So the inverse of alpha will be alpha bar divided by the norm, just like complex numbers. And then the point in this norm is never zero unless alpha itself is zero. So that shows that for the Hamiltonian continuum, any non-zero element actually has an inverse. But just look at the norm. The point of the norm is never zero unless alpha itself is zero. I hope, it, I hope this gives you some sense of how these quaternion algebras work. And of course, are there any questions for anyone? Okay. Of course, we, this is R, this is H. And you can actually show that if you look for all the finite dimensional algebras over the reals, and uh, you want them to be if you look, at, look for all the division rings over the finite dimensional division rings over the real numbers, there are only these three R, complex, and H. Is how many so the question is uh, well, are there other constraints? Like the H. Well, in some sense, as I just said, over R, uh, the only finite dimensional, I mean R dimension, uh, R dimensional, uh, R division algebra. Sorry, division R algebra. R. The real number itself, the compact number, these two are commutative, and then it's time to So you may say, okay, there's nothing to do now. So we can end the lecture at complex. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but we're number we're here for number theory service. So, so we we're not that into the real numbers. So we want to ask. Can we do this for our <coughs> view instead of just R? But we, when we, go, we will consider other things. For this talk, I'll be focusing on the case when the field is <coughs> rational. I guess. I guess most of the number theory questions are just about the rational numbers that you know, to start at least. So here's a more sort of general definition. So that can be a field. A political number is about the case when the characteristic is two. So let me just say the character is not equal to two. Uh, for any numbers a and b in k cross, I want to define. Uh, a, 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 a quaternion algebra. Over a I'm gonna, so this notation is not standard. Uh, I cannot think of a better way to write it in this vector, so I'll just use D. Uh, I normally use D for quaternions. And K, sub, 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 K as a subscript, tell you the field, and A, B are elements in. Okay, which are not zero. I just define to be sort of same thing as we defined Hamiltonian quaternion earlier. Instead of putting the real numbers here, I put the field k and generate by two elements i and j. Now I require that i square, original i square and j squares are both assumed to be negative one. Now I can you know loosen up a little bit. I can say okay, i square equals a and j square equals b, and I still want i j to be negative. And k is not equal to i times j. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
American peoples. <laughs> <laughs> Just to oh, raise the right hand forward. Entirely my fault. On my notes, I was using uh, math uh, all credits for the K and the Coterna. <laughs> so I really didn't spot that. Maybe I'll just cap it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, right, that one. Right, and then now if I can use a little K for IJ. So that's Similar to. Oh, just So I can put small k to be i j. Uh, let's make a small computation. So what is k squared, anyways? So k squared will be i j i j, right? <coughs> you have to be careful that you the order has to be preserved. So now you want to swap i and j to get negative i i j j. I'm writing things very stupid, like but whatever. <laughs> And now i squared is a, so at minus a b, j squared is b. So, so there's a negative sign here. Be a little careful. Okay. So let's give an example we have already worked out. That when k equals r, ah, uh, the uh, this Hamiltonian in my new notation. This is a quaternion algebra over the reals, where a and b are taken to be negative one, because i squared and j squared are negative ones. And what if I don't take negative one when the field is reals? What do I get? Well, let's see. Let me take another one. Say I take one and negative one. Okay, I mean I square is one and j square is negative. So I want to say that this is actually isomorphic to the matrix itself. It's different uh, from the Hamiltonian companion. But this is not a sort of division or anything because you see non-zero matrices may not have inverses. Right? Non-zero matrices can have rank one, cannot be inverted. So what's isomorphic? So you can send, uh, I mean, certainly you send sort of k linear matrix to the diagonal matrix a a, which is one with k algebra isomorphic, and the i, uh, which is not a usually measure in i, because i squared is not one, so you can send it to some matrix square is one, but you don't want to send to an inner matrix. Or negative. Negative. All negative? That's actually not a good idea in the sense of because you want to isolate so the negative one will be sent to the negative. I mean, right, right. You have to. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one, one, is here. one, one, and the other one is negative. And what about j? j, I want square to be negative one. But here's an interesting metric whose square is negative one, which is. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me just write double line zero. Oops, very so the entries I don't write down are zeros. Speculation. So this is one, zero, zero, negative one. For j, I want to send to this matrix. Zero, negative one, one, zero. If you do the computation in your head, the square of that is negative one. And you can also check that ij equals negative ji. I mean, under this axiom. Anyway, this matrix multiplied with so anti-diagonal minus one one. They're not they're not commuting with each other, but they're commuting up to a sum. So in general, uh, when in case R. There are only two kinds. If you have any sort of non-zero real numbers a and b, it's I, this, this quaternion algebra brab is either isomorphic to the Hamiltonian quaternion if both 
false and we are negative. Yeah. And it's isomorphic to the matrix algebra if one of A or B is positive. So that classifies all the quaternion algebras over R. Over this one. Uh, so now I want to do the same thing for arbitrary field K. Uh, but this is going to be very, very difficult. Why is that? Well, of course, I want to classify all quaternions. Over, maybe not over arbitrary field, but just somehow. Uh, just works, work out what? It's already non trivial. Work out over Q. But this is not so easy. Because of all. In a sense that, well, okay, okay it's easy to list all the quaternions. <coughs> Just, you just need to get a pair of non-zero rational numbers. But the difficult part is to determine which one of them are isomorphic. For example, you can swap the two numbers. This are is an easy isomorphic. Because in the way you define the container of i and j, it can be swapped. Or if you remember that over here, k square was negative a, b. So you can, instead of using i, j, you can use i and k to define the quaternion algebra. So that's the same as a and negative a, b. And uh, you can do some other crazy things. For example, I think if I remember correctly, you can do, it turns out this also has to move to a plus b times minus a, b. So this a plus b will correspond to uh, i plus j, and this minus a, b will correspond to k. So you have all these sort of uh, Strange isomorphism you have to sort out. It's a non-trivial task to actually uh, classify all the quaternion algebras over here. You, you need a plus b non-zero. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. So, the, so the real question is that: Can we really classify them over q? Yeah. Instead of actually doing the arithmetic, like trying out one by one, which is not going to be, which is probably not going to be possible, take a more sort of modern approach. This is the topic of this lecture series, a local global approach. Here's the idea. Here's a sort of a simple observation. Is that so I can, so if we start with the quaternion algebra with rational coefficients, I can define, I can, so this is algebra. I hope that tensor is okay. This is a four dimensional vector space over Q, but now I extend the scalar, allowing not only rational coefficients, I allow real coefficients. So this will be a four dimensional real algebra. So this is the same as just another way of writing dr maybe. And we can do a, a, some sort of a simple thing, simple sort of a test of whether two quaternion algebras over q are isomorphic. And the following. So suppose if for, for two pairs a, b, and a prime, b prime, and say non-zero elements, non-zero rational numbers, uh, if we have the corresponding real quaternions are not isomorphic, then there's no way for the corresponding rational coefficient quaternion to be isomorphic. Because if the rational co coefficient quaternions were isomorphic, now you just extend the scalar from Q to R, the real coefficient quaternion will be isomorphic. Now I'm doing a composite. And using this way to test whether the quaternion algebras over Q are isomorphic or not. 
But this is not, well, this is a good start. But that doesn't need to tell you too much, because the stuff I'm erasing now tells you that over R, there are only two kinds. But we're going to see over Q, there are, plenty, there are infinitely many time, types. So that's not enough to classify all the uh, quaternion algebras over the smaller field Q. So here's a new idea. We're going to sort of take this approach and elaborate on it in the sense of, uh, so I'm going to do two steps. I want, I want the point that I want to know whether these are isomorphic. That's usually difficult, but I want to test if they can. Oh. Okay, that was a question. Uh, for many, also many sort of big fields. Okay, tiny. We make lots of server tests because we, it's really difficult to handle the rational coefficient for training. But we can ex make some bigger field containing Q and ask, and where maybe the question is easier, and ask whether the corresponding quaternion, when extends scalar to this bigger field, are they isomorphic? If they're not isomorphic, then the corresponding quaternion over Q won't be isomorphic. And that allows you to have rule out sort of a lot of find many ways to tell different quaternions apart. But there's just how a key step, this is a sort of local global step. Well, I, I would say both steps are both slow. And if, it says that if the two quaternions pass all the tests we post up, then if they are isomorphic for all, I should say, all uh, good all sort of tests we ask and are and we can ask a question are they isomorphic? And like over Q there's really well, it's hopeless to test them. But if somehow we test all possible fields that we know how to test already. Is that enough to tell me that these two are actually isomorphic? Yeah, we run out of ideas. The, the only idea we have is that let's just hope that they're isomorphic if pass all the tests. So this is a part we're going to test. And this is a, so, so the R will be one of the field kinds. 